Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 8 in the textbook of Sengel and Kajar. Uh, chapter 8 on eternal forced convection. Just introducing forced convection. Introduction. First part in the textbook. The first part in the introduction, terminology is quite important. And the first terminology that is introduced is a pipe, what is considered with a pipe, a duct, a conduit, and a tube. And you will see that these things are being used everywhere, but they are actually small changes in terms of its meaning. Normally, in some literature, if it is circular in dimension, then, and this is actually the correct nomenclature, it will be called a pipe if epsilon of d is not equal to zero. So therefore, it means it is actually a rough tube. If it is a tube, then epsilon divided by d would be equal to zero. So that would be smooth. Now you will be surprised that I think most of you know this specific geometry, that of a pipe. And your first reaction would be to say that there should be a surface roughness. I mean, you can go and measure it, you can quantify it and therefore everything should actually be pipes. Well, in reality, if you go and measure the surface roughness on any pipe these days that you can go and buy, hard drawn, soft drawn, or whatever manufacturing technique is being used, for all practical purposes, it is actually smooth. And therefore, what you're going to work in industry with are normally tubes. So when do you get pipes? Pipes is actually from the old times when they casted the pipes. They used sand on the inner core, and those were very rough. And therefore, they are actually pipes. A tube can also, of course, change to a pipe because of corrosion, scaling, or other types of effects. Then there are ducts. Ducts are normally being used in the HVAC industry, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning industry. You might see them typically in geometry, sometimes rectangular, sometimes <coughs> more like that. And they are being used normally where we have low pressures. Typically, uh, the inside pressure is about 120 kPa, that's absolute, while the atmospheric pressures are approximately 100 kPa. So therefore, the pressure difference between the inside and the outside are at most approximately 20 kPa. So those are typically ducts, low pressure differences. With pipes, normally the delta P's are much more than hundreds of kPa's. And in many cases, we are talking of megapascals in terms of pressure. So a pipe or a tube can take a lot of pressure. The ducts, normally not. They are being used in the HVAC industry. And 
They are used typically in buildings. So if this is a tall building, this is the concrete slabs. Let's show it like that. Then in these buildings, they would put in a false ceiling. That would be the ceiling. And the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, the duct work, would typically, that is now the, the concrete slabs. Then these ducts will be placed into this areas here. And normally, they want it to be as small as possible. The smaller it is, the cheaper the bowling. So space is a very important thing. And this would typically maybe be the, the duct that would take in the cold air. And it would uh, distribute the cold air, while the return duct would return the warmer air to the air handling unit. So normally, they are used where there's space restrictions and normally also low pressure differences. <coughs> okay, now the purpose of the fundamental purpose of any tube or duct is for us to provide flow, convective flow, and that flow in fluid mechanics, we are always interested in the friction factor and the pressure drop. Why? Because that would determine the power required. <coughs> and the power required will always be with a pump or a fan. So that would sort of be the fluid mechanic side. Well, with the heat transfer side, the things that we are fundamentally always interested in is the heat transfer coefficient and the heat transfer rate. Those are the two things. And this is the thermal energy required. So when we, in heat transfer, ask you to get the heat transfer coefficient, on fluid mechanics, the friction factor, we are always interested in it because it works through towards what you're going to pay, what it is going to cost you, normally, always. Therefore, in the heat transfer course, we are not typically always going to ask you just the heat transfer coefficients and the heat transfer rate. Normally, they are connected, and therefore, in many, many problems, we want, to, we want both. And that is why the fluid mechanics part is so important in internal forced convection. Now, just to summarize, typically, the bigger picture in terms of chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9. Those are all three about convection. Chapter 7 was on external forced convection. Chapter 8 will be on internal forced convection, while chapter 9 will be natural convection. With external forced convection, we had a surface. This is the surface. And then we had a free stream velocity. And we had a boundary layer, two boundary layers. We had one for the velocity boundary layer, as well as the thermal boundary layer. But this boundary layer can have an infinite height. As long as we've got the surface, the boundary layer will grow and grow in size. So therefore, what is difference, different with internal forced convection compared to external forced convection 
is that we've got more than one boundary layer. And therefore, if the tube or the duct is long enough, and in most cases that is the case, the two boundary layers will meet. Okay. And this velocity V will sort of be only at one specific location. So therefore, working, at, working with the free stream velocity is not so practical. You're going to see later on that we're going to prefer rather to work with a mass flow rate. This one, we, ha we have no other choice because this is the free stream velocity, but always there's an outside part of the boundary layer. And outside the boundary layer, the velocity is always equal to the free stream velocity. So it doesn't matter where you are on the surface, somewhere you will still have the free stream velocity. Natural convection is now something different. I'm going to draw it typically maybe in a cavity. Okay? And in that cavity, we might have buoyancy forces because maybe that surface is hot and that one is cold, and maybe that one is cold and that one is hot. And this is just schematically. Now the three things, okay, now firstly, the, the problem in, in convection is that there are very simple geometries like that of a circular tube, which we can, from first principles, go and calculate the velocities and the heat transfer, and we've done that already. But in most cases, the geometries are much more complicated. And so far, nobody has figured out how to solve the Navier-Stokes equations so that it can be applied to any boundary layer. And therefore, we have to rely on experiments and to give us all the data we need so that we can do our designs as engineers. The problem is you can end up doing an infinite number of experiments if you don't think about these things very well. Now, fortunately, there were people before us who did that for us. And what they have found is that the heat transfer, which can be described by the Nusselt number, is a function of the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, and the Grassoff number. And Dr. Everts already introduced to you the Grassoff number. The Reynolds number, of course, is equal to the velocity multiplied by a characteristic length divided by the kinematic viscosity. The Prandtl number, which is Cp divided by V divided by K. And then the Grassoff number, which is equal to G beta. Ts minus T infinite, the characteristic length to the third, divided by the kinematic viscosity square. So the Reynolds number, as you know, is the ratio of the internal forces divided by the viscosity forces. The Prandtl number is an indication of the fluid properties or the relative thickness of the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer, while the Grassoff number gives us an indication of the buoyancy forces. And if we go and do experiments, what we should do is we should vary these, and if we vary these, we can get the relationship of the Nusselt number as a function of the others. And then, in many cases, or in most cases, we can, although maybe we did the experiments with water, we can go and apply that equation for a, a liquid like a glycol or any other gas or something like that. Right, paragraph 8.2 is about the average velocity 
and temperature, which we are going to handle different than that of external forced convection. You know already from fluid mechanics that if that is the tube, you're going to get a velocity distribution. If that is going to be the inlet velocity, you're going to have the no slip boundary conditions. The velocity is going to increase to a maximum velocity, V max. But in most cases in heat transfer, we will not be interested in this velocity profile. We would like to be very practical and make things simple, and therefore we are rather going to make use of the average velocity. The average, okay, which is going to be that velocity there. The same with the temperatures. With the temperatures, if the fluid is being heated, then the temperature profile is going to look like something like that. And that is going to be the temperature on the surface. Remember, temperature is not a vector. However, we can show the temperature maybe with lines like that. That would be the high temperature. That would be the low temperature. In this case, it would mean that the surface temperature is higher than that of the fluid. And again, what we're going to do is we are going to get this average value and we are rather going to work with the average temperature and that average temperature can be determined from an energy balance. I'm not going to go through all the mathematics now. This is in your textbook, but in principle it would mean that you can actually write that the mean temperature is equal to two times Take note the average velocity, so this can be expressed in terms of the average velocity, the radius square of the tube or the pipe, the integral from zero to R, the temperature as a function of R, U as a function of R multiplied by R dAc, something like that. It would therefore mean that in principle, if we could measure the temperatures everywhere inside a tube or a pipe, and that's practically very difficult, then we can go and calculate the exact mean temperature by looking at the velocity profile, taking it into consideration, as well as uh, the velocity profile, as well as the temperature profile, do the integration, and then get the average or the mean temperature. In terms of the Reynolds number, <coughs> In general, we've already written it down, it can be written as the density multiplied by the average velocity multiplied by a characteristic dimension, which can be L, and I'm going to write it as the diameter now, divided by the viscosity, and we can also write it as the average velocity multiplied by the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. Now, yes, this is the correct Reynolds number, and that is how many of you are going to calculate the Reynolds number in the tests and the exam. But if you've done this 10 or 20 or 30 times, you're going to find out that in many cases, to calculate the Reynolds number, you must first go and calculate the velocity. Because normally, as engineers, we would rather give not the velocity of fluid through a pipe, but we would rather give the mass flow rate. That is more practical. It's something that's easier to, to, to measure. And therefore, the Reynolds number can be written as a function of mass flow rate. And we do it like this. I mean, we just say the mass flow rate, as we know, is equal to rho multiplied by the area multiplied by V average. So you can derive it very quickly. And that is equal to rho the surface area of the cross-sectional area through which the flow through which the flow occurs is pi divided by 4d square multiplied by v average and then we can solve v average as a function of mass flow rate 
you can write V average is then equal to 4 times the mass flow rate divided by rho by d square. And we can substitute this average velocity back into that equation. And then we can derive that the Reynolds number is equal to 4 times the mass flow rate divided by mu, the viscosity and the diameter. And that is equation 8.5 in your textbook. Okay, however, and I would recommend that you put one of those tags in your textbook, you're going to, in many, many problems, you're going to look for this equation. As I've said, you can do it from that one, but you're going to waste a lot of time, so it is very easy to write the Reynolds number as a function of mass flow rate. However, there's a very important however, and that is, it is only for a circular tube because we have said that the area is equal to the area of a circular tube. If you change the dimensions to another geometry, so if you've got a geometry like this, and that is the dimensions A and B, then the Reynolds number is not equal to 4 times the mass flow rate divided by rho by you see, what do you use for the diameter now? Already, you already have a problem here. So please be very careful. This equation is only valid for a circular tube. And I've started introducing a practical problem, and that is that for many geometries, we don't have circular tu tubes. We've got ducts or other types of conduits, tubes. So therefore, let's just quickly revise the principle of your hydraulic diameter. Therefore, so therefore, going back to this case that we've considered here, what we need to do is write the Reynolds number as rho v average the hydraulic diameter divided by the viscosity. So if it's not circular, we need to calculate the hydraulic diameter. And you've done that in fluid mechanics. <coughs> but by just a few examples, I'm going to revise it to you. The hydraulic diameter definition, dh, is equal to 4 times the cross-sectional area divided by the wetted surface. That is the definition, and I think most of you know it, and most of you know where to get it. But I'm going to show you later on examples that's going to confuse you very quickly. If you do not apply this correctly, and if you do not really understand it. So this area is of the flow, not the duct, okay, of the flow, and this is the wetted surface, and you know it's the wetted surface, but it's the wetted surface of the gas or the liquid. So most students would say, yes, this is the cross-sectional area, and that is the wetted perimeter. And for many geometries, like this one, for example, if there's a fluid going through it, and it totally fills up that duct, then it's very easy to calculate it. So let's start, let's start very simple. Let's look at the square duct with dimensions of A and A. Then the hydraulic diameter 
is equal to four times the cross-sectional area. Okay, now that is the liquid. So take note, all that is the liquid or the gas. And therefore, the cross-sectional area of the things that flow through it is A multiplied by A. That's very simple. The wetted surface of the gas or the liquid, that surface has been wet, 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 and wet, so it is four times A. So the hydraulic diameter in that case is equal to A. Very simple. The same with a rectangular section like that, a duct. Again, that is all the flow. Let's suppose it's a gas. And that is A and that is B. Then the hydraulic diameter is four times the cross-sectional area. The cross-sectional area of the flow, not the duct. And that would be four times A multiplied by B divided by the wetted surface. And that would be A plus B plus A plus B. So it is 2 times A plus 2 times B. And you can go and write it as 2 times AB divided by A plus B. Very simple. Now, this one is now where things can start becoming a little bit challenging if you do not understand this very well or if you do not use these parts of the definition. In this case, there's going to be a liquid like in a channel, and that dimension is going to be A. That dimension is going to be B. And that is going to be H. So there's the liquid. So calculate for me quickly the hydraulic diameter of that case. <coughs> calculate the hydraulic diameter for me, please. I'm going to give you a second or two. The hydraulic diameter is equal to four times the area of the flow, not the duct. So the area of the flow is four times H multiplied by B. You agree? Okay. And now the weighted surface. The wetted surface of the gas or the liquid, the wetted surface will be equal to H plus B plus H. You agree? Okay. I hope those three examples will help you. The other one that is also important that we are going to use quite a few times is that of a tube inside a tube. So now we've got the flow there, maybe a liquid, and this might be a solid rot, or it might be that this flow is flowing in that direction, going into the board, and on that tube we've got flow coming in this direction, which is a tube in tube heat exchanger. Now if we are interested in the flow on the inside, then we just use the diameter because it's a circular tube to calculate the Reynolds number. But if we want to know what happens in the annulus, we need to get the hydraulic diameter of the annulus. And the hydraulic diameter of the annulus is equal to, let's call that dimension equal to di, the inner diameter, 
and that dimension, the outer diameter. These four times, the cross-sectional area of the flow, so it is this cross-sectional area there, it's four times pi divided by four, do squared minus di squared, divided by the wetted surface, and the first wetted surface will be this surface here, pi diameter on the inside, that would be the one surface, the wetted surface, and the other wetted surface will be that area there. Plus pi d0 square, oh, pi d0. And you can go and do the mathematics at home, but it's very easy to prove that it is nothing less than the difference in the two diameters, the outer diameter minus the inner diameter. I'm not going to do the math for you. It's just two, three steps, then you can prove that. Okay. Right, now let's look at typically what happens with a fluid inside a tube and we look at the velocity distribution at the inlet and this is being heated. So what we know is we're going to have a thermal boundary layer that's going to develop until it's fully developed at that point there, something like that. And here we're going to have thermal gradient like that, and that distance is equal to the thermal boundary layer thickness. And the very important thing to take into consideration is that if we would now go and determine the heat transfer coefficient in the x direction, that is x, then at this point here, there the flow is fully developed, and because it's fully developed, the heat transfer coefficient will be constant. So this is what we call fully developed flow, and I'm going to refer to this a lot. And this is developing flow. Fully developed and developing. And this length is called LT. And this heat transfer coefficient is therefore a function of x. It is not a constant value. And in this part, for laminar flow, the thermal boundary layer is going to be 0.12 multiplied by the Reynolds number, the Pranel number, and the diameter. Take note, in your textbook, it indicates that the thermal boundary layer is equal to 0.05 Reynolds Pranel diameter. That is from theoretical calculations. We have showed here at the University of Pretoria that is not correct. That value should actually be 0.12 before it is fully developed. So that is for laminar flow. For turbulent flow, LT is approximately equal to 10 diameters. Then it is fully developed. OK. 
Okay, just for clarification, okay. I'm going to show the hydrodynamic the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer. Okay. The thermal boundary layer is LT to indicate thermal. This one is the hydrodynamic one. That is the velocity profile. Okay. So for laminar flow, LH is equal to 0 0.05 Reynolds multiplied by diameter. Okay. So this is the blue case. The velocity boundary layer. The thermal boundary layer, however, is equal to 0 0.12 multiplied by the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, and the diameter. Okay. In the textbook, this is given as 0 0.05. So the difference between the two is firstly the Prandtl number, and then secondly this value of 0 0.12. Now remember, I have now showed that the velocity boundary layer is developed quicker before the thermal one. That is not always the case. There can be three cases, and we've already discussed it. And it is the Prandtl number which is actually going to determine which one is fully developed first. So if this is now the velocity boundary layer, I'm going to show the velocity boundary layer all at the same place then we can have the case where the thermal boundary layer is already fully developed there, or there, or there. And the difference is being indicated by the Prandtl number. So if the Prandtl number is smaller than 1, then this one will be fully developed first. If the Prandtl number is equal to 1, then it would be the same and if the Prandtl number is larger than 1, then that one will take longer. Okay. So therefore, it is also important that we think of that when we consider the heat transfer coefficients and the friction factors. So here we can have the heat transfer coefficient or the friction factor, heat transfer coefficient or friction factor, heat transfer coefficient or friction factor. This is all x, the longitudinal direction of the flow in the tube. And with this one, we are first going to have the fully, de oh, let, me, let me give you a, a blue one and a red one. The red one is going to indicate the thermal boundary layer, and the blue one is going to indicate the friction coefficient, like that. So there, that one is fully developed, and that one is going to be fully developed at that point there. In this case, where the Prandtl number is equal to zero, the friction factor one is going to be there, but the thermal boundary layer one is also going to be there. So both of them will be fully developed at the same point. And in this case, it will be the opposite. There it would be fully developed there, while the friction factor would already be fully developed there. 
And this is something that you always need to keep in mind when you look at internal convection. You always have to think how does things change on the inside and especially with the inlet. That is where we get the highest heat transfer but also the highest pressure drops. Question. Okay, so the, que the, the question is a very good question, and that is that how can this be, how can we have two different equations here with a prandtl number equal to 1, that, and, and this is not also equal to 0 0.05? Well, the answer is nobody experimentally did go and check this equation yet. The work that we've done is with the heat transfer. And most probably, it's a very good assumption to assume that that should also be 0.12. But nobody has proven it yet. So if you want to come and do your postgraduate studies, I would like to do that with you. Okay, so most probably it is. Good question. You're also going to see, and it's something that I'm going to highlight a lot, which is not clear in the literature, and I've mentioned it when we looked, when we worked through the chapter on on the fundamentals of convection, and that is the analogy between heat transfer and pressure drop. It's a fantastic analogy, but the analogy is very limited in terms of the previous work that has been done. What we've showed here in our laboratories is that the analogy always holds, even in the transitional flow regime. If you have one, then you can calculate the other one. And that is a fantastic thing to do. It means that actually it doesn't matter what complicated thermal system and or fluid system you have in, in industry. It can be a power station, it can be a turbine, it can be a, a heating and ventilation or air conditioning system. But it means that if you do measurements and you can get one, then you can calculate the other one directly without measuring it. That is some of the very special things that we find in our creation and in nature, that all these equations always hold. Now take note, <coughs> what I'm showing here is in general always true, but it is more true for laminar flow. When we get to turbulent flow, for turbulent flow, LH is 10 diameters and LT is also 10 diameters. So it's very quickly then the flow is fully developed. The number of applications that we get in industry where we normally have shorter types of links is very limited. They are, and there are also equations available that can give you that. However, in general, if you look for turbulent flow, for turbulent flow, and if you look at figure 8.9, if you look at this and this, you would actually say, but ach, this is a waste of time. Why are we actually looking at that? The reason is that typically you will see that two cases are being considered for turbulent flow. It's looking like that, and the results there are like this. And what you will have here is two cases, the case of heat flux is constant, and the other one of surface temperature is constant. Those are two very, very important cases that we're going to get in industry, and with my next lecture I'm going to start looking at that in much more detail. But depending on this boundary condition, The results may, may vary, but here you will see it is very small. But the reason why it is very small is because it's for turbulent flow. So in turbulent flow, in terms of what the heating of cooling condition is on the wall, 
would normally not be important at all, but it is extremely important for laminar flow or for cases of short pipes or tubes that is smaller than 10 diameter. What you will also see is that this Reynolds number here is 10,000 and that one is 200,000. So you will see that it is all turbulent flow. Reynolds numbers higher than about 2,300 to 2,700. So in general there we are not concerned about what happens with the flow development. Right, ladies and gentlemen, if there are no more questions, then, uh, then I'll see you again with the next lecture. Thank you very much.